They are the bad guys, the murderers, the terrorists. But why are we so fascinated about the villains rather than the heroes? What makes them so intriguing? In this episode of Cinema Talk, we're going to take a closer look at this fascinating phenomenon and how it has shaped modern Hollywood culture. This is Cinema Talk. Now please, quiet on the set. Good morning, afternoon, and or evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Allende Roberts with the new episode of Cinema Talk, movie talk for college movie fans. I'm the host, and joining me this week is two of my uh, special friends. Joining me on my right is my friend Casey Hitchens. Casey, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing? Doing well. And then right across from me is my main man, Zachary Rogers. How you doing? What's up, Allende? I'm doing great. Always great. Oh, it's a great day to talk about movies. Once again, guys, thank you so much for joining me on the show today. we got a great show for us. But first, as always, every week we will cover the box office. We're going to look at the top five in the box office this weekend. Uh, Bad Boys for Life, second largest Martin Luther King opening weekend is $68 million domestically. Uh, second place is Dr. Doolittle, projected to lose over $100 million at first, but outperform expectations, estimated $30 million, but is still projected to lose a lot. A, the margin right now is around $70 million, maybe a little bit higher. Third place, mm -hmm. 1917, dropping 40% after unseating The Rise of Skywalker last weekend. $27 million. Jumanji, the next level, hit number four. But the big story, number five, Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker, finally topped $1 billion after almost a month out of release. But some people are considering it a flop. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about that. I haven't actually seen it yet, so Ooh. I really want to see it. Well, as someone who's seen it, I do not think it's a flop. Me, personally, I think it's the best in that trilogy. Maybe not really the best in out of like the prequels, the original trilogy, and the sequels, but definitely the best out of the trilogy. I don't think it's the worst. Could be better. There was a lot of things I wish it would, they would have changed, but it was a good end to the series. Yeah. I think really the biggest story right now is Bad Boys for Life. He's showing Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. They still got it. Uh, Will Smith further cementing himself as a Hollywood star, a Hollywood moneymaker. Uh, Martin Lawrence, once again, showing that he, you know, he still has those comedic chops. He hasn't been in the movie in a very long time. But, hey, look at him. He's doing really well. Doolittle was a little bit surprising. It's Robert Downey Jr.'s first film after the, leaving the MCU. And it's a projected to lose almost seventy million dollars. It's a little bit worrying. I yeah, I looked. I I looked at reviews for this, and uh, critic reviews are pretty, or maybe not critic, but audience review is like pretty high. It's maybe like seventy, eighty percent. But it, well, it'll be interesting to see how next the uh, next week rolls around. Mm -hmm. All right, and our next part of our show, the movie news roundup. I picked out three stories, some three of the biggest stories in the movie industry, and we're gonna give our little brief thoughts about it. First up. No Time to Die, Billie Eilish has been set to perform the song for the new James Bond film coming out in April. Guys, do you have any thoughts about that? It's actually just really interesting because Billie Eilish, I mean, she's basically the pinnacle of teenage music. So her uh, going into a James Bond film is just kind of interesting to me. Uh, this kind of rem reminds me of like Skyfall, the opening of Skyfall. I can't remember. It was Adele who did that and that... Skyfall was one one of my favorites of Bonds, so I I'm interested to see how like she puts a spin on where where they're gonna where they're gonna insert it in the movie, whether it's gonna be the beginning, middle, or end, or how that's gonna affect the tone of the movie. Um, from my understanding, it's going to be just like how Skyfall was, or like uh, Writings on the Wall for Spectre. They're gonna, it's gonna be the song that's played during the, mm. the credits. I don't know. I'm excited for it. Um. I don't want to keep my expectations too high, but, you know, I hope it rounds out Daniel Craig's character. All right, second, Oscar nominations that came out just a couple weeks ago. There's been a lot of talk about snubs and movies that should have been nominated. Guys, do you have any 
notable snub. I wasn't really paying attention much to the Oscars this year. I never really am, but I don't know if you have any, Zach. I have one movie, just one, Knives Out. I have no idea why this is not in Best Picture because Ryan Johnson did an incredible job with this movie. Just the way that he just flips back between timelines and also just the tones that are shifted throughout the movie. And it's very surprising what happens throughout the movie and what happens at the end. And Daniel Craig in the movie, which, like, I only saw him as James Bond. I only saw him with an English accent. He pulled off his character phenomenally. And I just don't understand why he's not nominated with some of these actors on here, which they deserve, but some I don't think do. Okay. I, I can I can sort of concede that. I mean, I've been talking about how much Adam Sandler blew my mind in Uncut Gems and J-Lo blowing my mind in Hustlers. If you listen to the weekly radio show, you would have heard how much I praise her performance in that movie. Even though the movie may not be Oscar caliber, her performance certainly was. So I think those are two actors that definitely deserve a nomination. And our final story... Scott Derrickson, former director of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, has left the project due to quote-unquote creative differences. My question to you guys is, can a film recover after losing directors like this? It's hard to see because some films have, but some films haven't. One notable one that hasn't is Justice League, where the former director, I feel, what was his name, Zach? Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder, he left due to um, just personal issues, and then the director who took over tried to put in his own form of humor, and that just didn't really work for the Justice League. And so uh, it's too early to see right now. It's going to be interesting to see who fills in the director role and how they're going to develop the story as it goes on, but it's too early to see for me. I just feel like that director's kind of put their own little spin on movies a lot of times and it's like when that creative energy gets changed into a new director especially in this instance if it happens to Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness then is it going to completely change the role of the movie is it going to completely change the box office numbers you can't really tell at this time I would like to just bring in a little bit of new news that just came out um they're slated to be filming in May even without a director I think that's going to be a very interesting production I'm not sure wh who the new director is going to be. Kevin Feige has said that the tone that they he wanted and the tone that Derrickson wanted, they were conflicting tones. Feige wanted an action movie with heart elements and Scott Derrickson wanted a horror movie with action elements. So you can see where the kind of divide mm -hmm. happens. But I'm, I'm interested to see. I've, this is my most anticipated movie of Phase 4. I'm kind of nervous because I love <laughs> Scott Derrickson. I love Sinister. It's one of my favorite horror movies. But again, we will see. So, for our big topic, we've been liking a lot of bad guys lately. Some of the greatest characters of all time are not the goody two-shoes, righteous heroes. They are our villains. Mm -hmm. And so, guys, let's, let's just go ahead and rattle off a couple of great villains that we really enjoy. I know I can talk about the joke <laughs> all day. Heath Ledger, Joaquin Phoenix, Ooh. you pick one. So good. I don't, for me, it's Heath Ledger. I don't know. I haven't seen the full movie to kind of see Joaquin Phoenix's performance, but his role in other movies legitimizes his role as Joker, but I really, really like Ledger's Joker. That kind of brought something new to the table that we haven't really seen like at the time for villains, especially with Batman, because most of the villains were just kind of like, oh, they're doing evil things. He had a legitimate reason for what he was doing, even though it was chaos. He had a plan. And I just, I love Heath Ledger's Joker. Yeah, I actually have three favorite Jokers. Of course, Joaquin Phoenix and Heath Ledger are on the top of my list, but I also love Jack Nicholson's Joker. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. the whole gangster playoff and the revenge and just, in my opinion, um, my favorite is definitely Heath Ledger on that one. I have to agree with you. Because when you can see just how corrupted he is, I guess corrupted would be the wrong word. Bad would be the word. Just how bad he was by his eyes. Like you can tell a lot about a villain by his eyes. And that's what makes them a great actor is just portraying the whole villain aspect through their eyes. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm the person that's not on the same side as you guys because I honestly prefer Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. Everyone knows I've been raving about Joaquin Phoenix's portrayal of the Clown Prince mm -hmm. of Crime. And like, it's very disturbing. You could tell because of the way the media was sort of telling the story of what the Joker was that this performance is something to behold. It's getting so much media attention. Not to say that Heath Ledger's performance wasn't anything notable. 
But just to see the response and people were actually afraid mm-hmm. that something was going to happen because of this movie, because of the portrayal of this evil supervillain, in reality, it's just about a guy who needed help and could not get the help that he needed. So it, it's that to me is was a mark of a great villain because mm. you felt bad for him to the point where you did not want him to put on the suit and the makeup you mm. want to say please get better please we don't want you going down that road but once you once he got down that road you couldn't sit there and say he didn't have a reason the reason's wrong but you have to admit he still had a reason just like another villain thanos oh yeah that one's good easily the best super villain in the mcu by a country mile <laughs> It was, again, another one of those characters where, like, you don't agree with what he's saying, but you understand exactly why he's doing the thing that he does. Yeah, mm mm-hmm. I'm going to put another one out there. Anakin Skywalker slash Darth Vader. Everyone has their opinions about hating Christensen. One of my favorite Star Wars movies is Revenge of the Sith because of the way he portrays his fall to the dark side. Because we were all, if we've seen the original trilogy before Revenge of the Sith, we know what's going to happen. But you're like, no, don't do that. You're kind of rooting for him not to do that. But once he's down that path, kind of see the reasons why. And it's just kind of heartbreaking. I don't know, Anakin Skywalker slash Darth Vader is one of my favorite villains. Especially when he dons the name Darth Vader and the suit. It's just... I have to agree with that. And, um... I think, who who was the voice actor who voiced... Uh, James, James Earl Jones! Yes, he's always one of my favorites for voice acting and just acting in general. I love seeing him. And just the whole Darth Vader behind the mask and one of the greatest cinematic reveals in history. One of my favorite villains for just, like he said, with the backstory and just seeing Anakin grow up as this young boy into not knowing what his fate was, just innocence at that age. And, I mean, to be fair, the previous prequels weren't that great, the very beginning, but they got better with the introduction of Luke Skywalker, in my opinion, but I think Anakin takes one of the top spots for me as well. Okay, I I gotta talk about this guy. I love the Terminator franchise. Uh, Okay, okay. And the T-1000 is, like, one of the most ruthless villains I have ever (laughs) seen in a film. He's not like a Thanos or a Vader or anything like that. He's just a guy out to kill somebody. And Robert Patrick's portrayal, it's a cold, unfeeling machine that is just on the hunt for young John Connor. Mm. And with Arnold Schwarzenegger protecting John Connor, what's going to stop this T-1000? It's a liquid metal Terminator. And it's <laughs> villains don't necessarily always have to be the sympathetic ones. They can just be somebody that's cold and ruthless. Another one, Leonardo DiCaprio in Django Unchained. Mm-hmm. His character, Calvin Candy. You cannot sympathize with that guy. He's just straight up a bad person. A cold, heartless villain that got his just desserts. I actually read an interview with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio about that movie. And apparently he like had second thoughts about the movie because it was so racist. Mm-hmm. And like all the stuff that he was saying, like... It was just affecting him that much. And on top of that, the whole character, Calvin Candy, the plantation where he, what he owned was just called Candyland. Like that was just, oh, I don't know. It was just one of those things where it was like something so sadistic and he calls it Candyland. I think on the other, like kind of going along with that, with just kind of like villains who are bad to be bad. John Doe from Seven, he like he has his reasons for it. He has, like, the seven deadly sins, but I have no words for it because it's watching it is just insane. Just seeing how he unraveled the protagonist, technically. We've been naming a lot of really evil guys, but we haven't really gotten to the what makes a great villain, and that's where we're going to start. What makes a really bad villain somebody that's not memorable what makes Mm. a good villain great what makes a good villain to me is basically taking you on this emotional roller coaster having the Mm. sad backgrounds of like the why did these events occur to make this this character just fly off the handle and become evil and what makes a bad villain at least for me is being over the top i don't like somebody who is like trying too hard to be bad and just make these outrageous claims and you don't know anything about them and it's just for the cinematic purpose i like a little bit of deepness for the character well sometimes over the top super villains can be served a purpose like well the fast and the furious movies mm-hmm. hobbs and shaw actually idris elba's villain is very over the top 
but he fits the purpose of that film. That film's just supposed to be over the top, just yeah. like action sequences with The Rock just flexing his muscles for no reason. Like, yeah. See, what makes a good villain to me is not the character itself; it's the story surrounding him. Depending on what movie you're watching, depending on if they get a backstory or not, the tone on what lines they're saying, and also where the story's going in conjunction with the protagonist or with the hero. I mean, that's what makes a good villain for me. Like, if we talk about Thanos again, he has his rhymes, he has his reasons, but also you have the conflict between the Avengers and Thanos. They need to stop Thanos. And that narrative is why I like Thanos. It's... I was actually about to use the Joker as an example. You have three different portrayals of the Joker. You have Joaquin Phoenix, Heath Ledger, and Jared Leto. Two of those are emblematic of what a good villain is, and the, the latter <laughs> one is the ex example of what a bad <laughs> yeah because again looking at walking phoenix again he is a sympathetic character you don't want him to go to the dark side but once he gets there you understand all of the variables all of the factors that drove him to that point with heath ledger he is chaos incarnate he even he says in the scene where he was burning the tower of all the money he was like it's not about the money it's about sending a message man just wants to create chaos for the sake of creating chaos but then you look at Jared Leto's Joker. What was he? He was a eccentric mobster, gangster type Joker that we don't really see a lot. Not even in the comics, you don't get a, that kind of Joker. Hmm. The Joker's always been someone who's very sophisticated. He does everything for a reason. Even if it doesn't seem like there's a reason to it, there's always a reason. This Joker was wild for the sake of being wild. And to me, that is why people disregard that Joker as a legitimate Joker because it's not a sophisticated role. And you don't have to be sophisticated to be a villain. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have to have some sort of nuance with your villainy. You can't just be an over-the-top villain, when, especially when you're compared to guys like Heath Ledger, True. Jack Nicholson, Cesar Romero. You're right, you're right. Well, there wasn't a lot of screen time for Jared Leto's Joker. But also, it has to go back to the tone and what was being shown in the movie, where it was going, the direction it was going. It wasn't shown a lot, and what was shown was kind of like separate from the movie. It wasn't really essential to the plot. It was essential to Harley Quinn, but it wasn't really essential to the plot going forward. So it was hard to root for him or to actually like him because it didn't really serve the story in any purpose. I didn't really enjoy Suicide Squad that much. I hate to say it. <laughs> I don't think anybody it did, was, it but... Was just, I mean... Because, like, the whole character of Joker with Jared Leto, like, I just, I didn't understand it. I mean, I understand it for the fans who want to see that romantic side of stuff, just romanticizing the villain. I just, I disagree with that just because that's not how I saw the Joker, and I feel like that was just a huge downfall. Nobody likes Suicide Squad. <laughs> <laughs> but we've been talking a lot about the Joker, and that brings up something that I wanted to discuss as well. This is one of the first times that a very major super villain has got his own origin story, his own solo film. So the begs the question, when does a villain achieve that solo film status, if that's even a thing? What other villains do you think deserve like their own solo film? I don't know. It's a hard question because if there hasn't been that many movies. I think Joker may be the only one with like a very legitimate like villain to get its own movie and to have critical praise for it what warrants them to have their own movie is fans who want to have that and you know just popularity pretty much it's not all popularity contests but if you get that popular side of that then you get the green light to make the movie i can't think of any notable characters that i would want to have like a solo movie because I really enjoyed them in the movie, but that's where they need to be. Like, I don't necessarily want to know their story. And, like, you can go to comics, you can look at other videos. And that brings up a question, like, what you were saying. Maybe there's not a lot of villains that should get their own solo movies. What makes the Jokers an exception to this solo film rule? I've heard a lot of people that were saying, like, Avengers Infinity War... It is an Avengers film, but it's Thanos' movie. Mm -hmm. Nobody's really looking for a, a Thanos solo film. But the Joker is something different where you everyone's been clamoring about this solo new take on the Joker. Like mm -hmm. it raises the question like why the Joker has become such this anomaly of film where he's the it feels like he is the only one that can get its own his own solo. Well, I think it's because 
any other superhero movie, I'm just like use superheroes for this, but any other superhero movie, the villain either dies or he's in jail. We kind of know the end. Heath Ledger's Joker, we didn't know what was going to happen to him. Like maybe he was going to Arkham, but he was just a mystery in itself. We had no idea what his backstory was. We had no idea what his motivations were except chaos. And so I feel like people were clamoring to get into the mind of the Joker because no one knew who he was and what his motivations were and where he came from. And so I think he's the exception because he was such an enigma before. I just feel like that there's been so many types of Joker that I think fans were finally wanting, like, who is Joker really? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I really enjoyed Joker as well when I saw it in theaters because I was like, oh, it's not the villain who makes the villain, it's society that made the villain. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that was mm -hmm. a really good society, point. society, <laughs> bottom tax. <laughs> oh my gosh. And, you know, that was just a huge shocker to me because in my experience with movies, I don't know if you guys have seen any, but there's nobody who really takes that aspect of the villain and applies it to, like, the majority of the movie. Mm. I'm not entirely sure who deserves to have that kind of spotlight on them with their own movie, especially since, like, the Joker was so good. It was like, I guess people have to really be careful with their villains when they make a solo movie because you could either screw it up or make it a huge hit. Yeah, and that's always the fear, right? You don't want to oversaturate the market with a certain type of genre of film, even a subgenre film like super villain origin stories. You don't want mm -hmm. to, you don't want to oversaturate that market. Joker is something different, something that we don't get in movies nowadays. I don't think we need another solo origin story for a villain. Mm -hmm. It would be cool. Like I know a lot of people consider the Terminator a example of villain solo film but he wasn't like an established character yeah. until james cameron created the terminator well i also know that they're making birds of prey as well with harley mm -hmm. quinn so would you consider that a solo movie that's uh... consider harley quinn a super <laughs> yeah that's where not again that's where that gray area lies right that... because harley quinn has mm -hmm. now reached a, the status of anti-hero not necessarily a villain. and that's a great point because that was going to bring me to there have been solo films, but they've mostly been anti-heroes, like Venom. And I can't think of any, any else right now, but mostly... Deadpool. Yeah, Deadpool, yep, there you go. But Deadpool and Ven Venom, they're anti-heroes, they're not villains. That doesn't show like their fall to being a villain, to being corrupted. It shows them actually doing heroic things. Not in all of the best ways, but <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. it gets the job done. Yeah. Again, that's what I'm seeing with Birds of Prey. Like, obviously, she's doing some like under the table stuff she's robbing a bank she's getting pet hyenas but <laughs> at the same time she's still doing some she's still going after a bigger villain in ewan mcgregor's black mask and you have characters like black canary who's canonically a hero huntress who's canonically an anti-hero renee montoya who becomes a this the hero of the question again another hero and cassandra kane who ends up becoming batgirl another hero so again that's you can we can consider Birds of Prey a super villain solo film, if we consider Harley Quinn as a super villain and not an antihero, and I think that's the question. I know that they were also talking about in a Loki movie oh. with the Avengers, but at the same time, do you consider him an antihero? Well, that's another question because yeah. let's be real, he is a villain. But he again, is because of popularity and because of Thor Ragnarok again, has pushed him to that level of anti-hero status. Mm -hmm. He's not necessarily the bad guy, but he is the bad guy. He's a bad guy for the purpose of the film. Yeah, if I could... Well, so they are making a Loki series. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. And it's going to be right after the Avengers, like in Avengers Endgame, where he portaled away with the Tesseract. I'm interested to see what happens there, because that's when he was, like, peak villain. That's when he was, like, doing things for his own gain, for his power, for what he wants. And so I'm interested to see if they tap into the villainous side or if they go more anti-hero route. Yeah, it'll be very interesting. I'm actually really looking forward to that. Guys, I got a game for us. Oh, buddy. So I'm going to choose a couple villains and... In one or two sentences, together, we're going to try and ruin this villain. We're going to try to make these bad guys worse than they already are. No! 
Oh so no. First off, we're gonna start off with a classic, the T eight hundred from the original Terminator. <sighs> How do you ruin the Terminator? That is a hard question. <laughs> That's very hard. Well, let's keep in mind that is this is night this is in the eighties. Yeah. Where this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Maybe a casting. Maybe Ooh. a casting change, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if anybody can, po- anyone that was as popular as Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the 80s and early 90s, uh, maybe Steven Seagal yeah. becoming the, the T-800. Because, like, Steven Seagal, his, his demeanor is no in no way, shape, or form as intimidating as Arnold Schwarzenegger. Maybe Sylvester Stallone at also, the time. S- Stallone, but Stallone had Rocky. He You're was right. Already, he was already an icon. You would, I would assume you'd have to pick somebody who... Had an action hero that has is past their prime, that probably ruined that term. The T eight hundred. I, like maybe a casting direction, maybe like different from Arnold, but I think kind of shifting the tone, making maybe making it more comedical. Yeah, or maybe adding like one of those secret weaknesses that you see <laughs> in superhero movies, <laughs> like you know, with I forget which movie it was, but like it was an alien invasion movie, and they were like the one weakness was water. Oh. Uh- so oh, like, signs. Yes. Oh, okay. Signs, and it's just like having one of those weaknesses for the villain. So it's like it could have been ruined, in my opinion, if they were like, "Oh, he has a, se- <laughs> he has a secret weakness to fried spaghetti." Like, <laughs> like what? Okay. Um, we gotta talk about the main villain of the Harry Potter franchise, Ooh, hoo, hoo. Tom Riddle himself. How do you ruin? The Lord of Evil. Giving him a nose. <laughs> I was just about to say that. That was my first thought. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, I mean, giving him a nose. He, he's so, his noseless face is so iconic. Mm-hmm. Right? He, yeah. he looks like a snake, and he just, I guess, putting it makes him le- look less intimidating. And like when he's in the Goblet of Fire, we just like killed the spare, and it wouldn't have been <laughs> it wouldn't. intimidating if you just see like a nose like mine or something, just like right there. Yeah. Ralph Fiennes did an amazing job with Voldemort. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I feel like casting anyone else, it would have felt different. Maybe, maybe it wouldn't have been worse, but it would have been very different. Cause I know from like four to eight, cause there were eight movies. Um, there is at least three or four different directors. So, but Voldemort stayed the same, pretty much. Next up. This is going to take us back to the days where James Cameron was king. The Titanic. Oh, my gosh. Billy Zane's character of Cal Hockley. How do you make a despicable guy a worse person than he already is? I'm just going to say this off the bat. have not seen Titanic. I'm not going to see Titanic. Hey, that's fair. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Here, I, I, I will say this. He's a, he's a, he's just a rich guy. He's just a really pompous rich guy. How do you ruin a really pompous rich guy? Taking the bodyguard away from him, probably, <laughs> in the movie, because that was basically his firepower. Like, I don't know how, how many just, times you guys watched the movie, but he was just a smarmy. He was just a smarmy little prick who just <laughs> he really was looking after for himself and nobody else. I don't know how you can ruin somebody like that, um, except for killing him in like the first ten <laughs> minutes of the movie. I mean, yeah, yeah. Then, yeah. Or having or having him die in, at the end when the when the Titanic sinks, but at the end of the day, that's what everybody would want to see anyway. <laughs> I thought it was a good choice, especially with James Cameron, to keep him alive at the end. But again, he ended up committing suicide later, and they kind of said it during the Great Depression mm-hmm. because uh, he lost all of his money. And I just thought, you know, that wasn't really the poetic justice that he deserved. But at the same time, I thought. It, if it, if it was like he got pushed off the ship and that's how he died, it would just be very like, okay, like that's not really, not really a good justice, but. All right, we're going to go with the man of multiple chins, the MCU's Thanos. He's a villain that is very, very hard for people to like really ruin. Can we do it? It's very, very hard to. Well, actually, it could also be very easy to. I don't know if you guys have seen the epic rap battles of history oh, no. with no. Thanos and J. Robert Oppenheimer. Mm-hmm. That's how you ruin him. <laughs> you make him practical. You try to do practical effects. Mm-hmm. It's not going to look as good. Josh Brolin's portrayal through the CGI is 
fantastic. I cannot imagine Thanos looking any other way. He looked like he could just stand right in front of us right now, and we can touch him. Like, oh wow, he's real. Those 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 muscles are actually large. If you try to make it practical, you have to build around the physique of Josh Brolin, and you don't get the commanding like size of Thanos. You, you don't get that feeling that you all of the Avengers need to get together to take this dude down. I think another way to ruin him, uh, you know Ronan and Guardians of the Galaxy, if you just take his reasons for being evil and push that on Thanos, ruined. Because in Infinity War, which is my favorite MCU movie, just gotta say that, he, he is very, like, very easy to be sympathetic towards. His goals are justified. If you bring the Ronin aspect to, like, I'm going to kill everything because I want to, I feel like that would have ruined him. And he's kind of like that in Endgame, but not really. He still has reason in Endgame. Yeah. In when him and Cap and Thor met up in Thanos in the wreckage, he said, you know, I thought after exterminating half of life, you know, everybody would be grateful, but you show me that if people that are alive knew what was, they're going to be unable to accept what can be, so mm-hmm. I'm going to just destroy everything <laughs> and then restart it so that whoever is alive will only know what has been given to them then, and they wouldn't know that they have lost a lot, a quote-unquote grateful universe. Guys, we come to the last one. The most difficult one for me, at least. Ruin the Joker. Ooh. Um, you can pick whichever version of the Joker you want. What? Whichever? Whichever Joker. I think with all of them, changing the face paint. <laughs> yes. Not having the classic Joker mm-hmm. and just, you know, doing something different, I think, would not even... Like, especially going against the comic books. I think that would be kind of... Giving Heath Ledger's Joker a backstory. I feel like that would have ruined the movie. It would have ruined the mysteriousness of his character. And it wouldn't really have been a good antithesis to Batman. If you knew what his backstory was. I know we like kind of all speculated that with his line to Harvey Dent. Being like truckload of soldiers blowing up. But like that makes it mysterious. I'm going to tell you how you ruined Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. <laughs> oh, no. We've all seen the movie, right? Well, I have. I've seen a little you, bit. I've seen know, a little you, bit. You, you know what happened to. You know, Joker goes on. Oh show. yeah. Yeah. And if he killed himself on that show, would have totally ruined him. If he didn't kill Murray Franklin, he would have. It would have ruined him. That would because everything that this version of the Joker has been building up to is been building up to the fact that either A is taking himself out on live television, or B he's going to make a name for himself. He's going to kill the man that is that made fun of him, and he's going to drive Gotham into anarchy and become, well, basically the Rat King. None of that happens. What is so threatening about this Joker? You take out any of that. He doesn't become a martyr, and he's not and he's not an icon. He doesn't he doesn't get the Waynes killed. What does this Joker do? He's just a guy who wore face paint who just had a bad day, had a lot of bad days, but at the end of the day, he's still just another guy. He's Mm -hmm. nothing special. And it's the moment where he says, you're awful, Murray, that he becomes something special, becomes something different. And then that was the turning point for me once he, like, he became, he became the Joker. Arthur Fleck died with his mom. But the Joker, the the character of the Joker, the clown prince of crime, he, I, as soon as he says, you're all for Murray, playing my video, screaming on the show, you just want to make fun of me, that is when he, that is when the Joker is full force, he is mm-hmm. unapologetic, he is going to kill somebody, and he's not going to feel bad about it. You take that away from him, who is this Joker? He has he's no purpose. I yeah. thought the movie would be really different if they didn't have the mental illness as- aspect and the the talk with his, I guess, was it a therapist? Yeah. I guess that's, yeah. So, like, just having that and how the system failed him. That was really entertaining, let's be honest. Well, now we come to the final segment, the reshoot Ooh. segment. It's a little quick one question just posing to you guys to close out the show. You're going out on a Saturday night. You don't really have a lot of friends who can come out with you, but you got one supervillain you can take out with you on a Saturday night. Who would you take? There's a lot. There's definitely a lot. Since film's been going on for like 
60 years, a lot of good villains. I want to say Hans Gruber, man. Dude, that that is my guy. He pretends to be a terrorist, which he's not a terrorist, as we see. He's just a regular bank robber, but he pretends to be. He pretends to be one. I feel like we would just get along. We would get along and be have a great night. Have you guys ever seen uh, Lost in Powers? Dr. Evil. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm sorry. But that guy is <laughs> hilarious. And, and just taking him just out to a nice dinner and just him asking me for a million dollars or just, I don't know. I just, I love his character. I love his comedy. He would be really chill for a Saturday night. I'm going to go with my man's Eagle of the Living Planet. Like, oh. come on. One, he is a planet. And two, like, is Kurt Russell. I mean, yeah. Kurt Russell's a pretty cool dude. Yeah, so. Kurt Russell's awesome. Like, have you seen the interviews with this guy? He's so much fun to talk to. Like, I would love to go out on a Saturday night just going out to a bar with him and just be like, just talk to him. Like, it, I have to go with Ego. And also, like, again, he's a planet. He can make whatever he want on his mm-hmm. planet. You know, our man Star-Lord made a Pac-Man. <sighs> so, I mean, that's. I think that'd be really cool. He'd be a lot of fun. Granted, we take out the whole homicidal one. Oh, yeah. Make everything him. Other than that, no, I, I love to hang out with him. Well, that's the reason why his name is Ego. Yeah, because he's got a big one. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Cinema Talk. Casey, Zach, will extend my thanks for you guys coming on the show. I'm so glad you guys were here. We had a great talk. This has been Cinema Talk. Thank you, and I hope to see you guys later and scene.